Good morning. It's great to be here with you today to help kick things off. I was very happy and excited to get the invitation to come speak at Interop and give you some of my thoughts and perspectives around where technology is today and where it's headed or could head. I believe that today we're at a real crossroads in terms of our technological evolution. And we have some tough questions in front of us, and we need to make some hard choices. When I started in the PC era, the PC revolution, I had the good fortune of working on Windows uh, through more than uh, 10 releases. And all of that, in hindsight, was just the beginning of everything that we're seeing today. There's been an, an incredible explosion of standards, protocols, APIs. We've seen the rise of open source and all of the choices and complexities that come with everything that we're dealing with today. But let's go back in time to the advent and the early days of the mini computer and the mainframe. Back then we had punch cards, we had floppy drives, we had simple operating systems and a choice of just a few programming languages like COBOL, Pascal, or assembly. And when we sat down to write a new application or implement a new feature, choices were limited. Fast forward to today, when you sit down to build something new, the choices you have are almost uncountably many. And often there's not really one way, one right way to build something. There are a myriad of ways, and you have to often make the best guess as to what choices uh, you need to make. The reason, the fundamental reason for this rise in complexity is this curve, the exponential curve. Perhaps the best example in our industry that describes this accelerating rate of change is Moore's Law, which describes the increasing density over time of transistors that make up computer circuits. But there are many other examples. For example, the rise in global internet traffic or the increase in mobile applications after app stores came online or the ever-increasing density of storage. And this curve, I believe, is the reason why we are at our at crossroads today. We'll look at proceeding down the road that we're really already on and what lies ahead of us on that road and then consider the possibility of moving in a different direction. So proceeding on the road that we're on is perhaps the wrong question because in many ways we are actually lost in a maze, a technological maze of our own making. And over time we've accumulated technical debt, we build siloed, fragile, increasingly complex architectures that are difficult to maintain, let alone evolve. It's perhaps not entirely our fault. We as human beings did not evolve to deal naturally with exponential change. The reality is that we evolved over a long period of time, over eons, dealing with incremental, slow-moving change. So it's hardly a surprise that when we apply our incremental, linear approach to dealing with exponential technology change, we run into a problem. This chart describes the amount of code complexity in different types of applications and systems. So a mobile application just has a few hundred thousand lines of code. An office suite may have millions, but then look at uh, Google, which has literally billions of lines of code that make up its systems. Now, Google is a leading edge uh, modern technology company but even they face the challenge 
of somehow ensuring that those billions of lines of code that have driven its business forward don't become legacy that hold it back in the future. This challenge of legacy is one that we face every day. And this stat shows the extent of the challenge. 80% of IT budgets today are spent on maintenance, simply keeping the lights on and making sure that everything we built continues operating. This is another way to look at that challenge. Only 10%, 10% of IT leaders today feel that they are using innovation effectively to drive their businesses forward. Now, this is especially troubling given the fact that we're living in the application economy where every company needs to be a software company. Part of what's gotten us here is the relentless focus and pressure on the immediate. We're all under pressure to deliver those set of bug fixes next week or those application updates next quarter or that new application that we're developing over the next year. And in fact, our budgets are really set on fairly short time intervals, 12 months typically. This causes us to lose sight of the forest for the trees, the bigger picture of the changing technological landscape, now how we have to evolve to fit into it over time. One of those changes in the technological landscape that will have significant impact is the rise of machine learning and artificial intelligence. Now, we've had the dream of AI since the very first days of the computer, the first invention of computers as a, uh, as a, as a machine. And in fact, we called the earliest computers electronic brains. That dream is now starting to be realized. There's been incredible progress over the past five years or so around data science, machine learning, and true machine intelligence. But with it come new questions and new responsibilities. Our storytelling and folklore has been filled with images of good robots and bad robots, and good robots that have turned bad. How do we design software to be good instead of bad? What does that even mean? How do we deal with software in terms of ambiguity? How do we program morality into software? These questions were once simply theoretical, but they are now confronting us in the real world today. Through that evolution, it's critical that we realize that we make technology in our own image, and the image that we see in the mirror is simply a reflection of us. So let's think about these challenges in the context of taking a fork in the road, a different path from the one that we've been on. If you look at this image, it's not going to be recognizable. But if we zoom out, it becomes recognizable as a Jackson Pollock painting. So what does a painting have to do with technology, you might ask? It, it's an important example of context, being able to zoom out, look at the pic, big picture, and understand what it is that we're looking at. Other aspect of what we need to consider going forward more deeply is purpose. What is the reason that we want to get from point A to point B? What is the right path for that destination? And being able to precise, precisely define our goals and context. So the what and the why are critical to be precise and clear about, but in order to achieve meeting those goals, we need a different operating framework. We need a different how than the one that we've been using. This is a symbol for Kaizen, at the heart of which is the notion 
of ongoing continuous change and improvement. Those two principles are also at the heart of agile methodologies and DevOps best practices that we're seeing our industry adopt at scale. And for good reason, because the notion of IT as a rigid organizational construct is simply not well suited to dealing with ongoing exponential change. We need a different way to operate. In fact, it's not sufficient for us to try to somehow react more efficiently to change. We need to re-engineer how we do what we do fundamentally to be engineered for change. Ultimately, our purpose is to create value and to create new experiences that are meaningful. You can perhaps think about this as two essential major components separated by a very thin, even sometimes invisible line. Above this imaginary line, we have what I think of as the idea factory. This is where you dream up new features, new products, new business concepts to help drive your business forward. But just coming up with ideas doesn't necessarily create anything. You need to have a mechanism, some means to take those ideas and make them real. And that's where the notion of a modern software factory comes into play. The ability to design, develop, test, deploy, and operate new software as ideas flow in to the software factory in a frictionless and seamless way, and the ability to do that at scale and at speed. There are two trends in technology today that I believe will have a major impact on being, to, being able to build modern software factories. The first of these is containers and, relatedly, microservices. For many years, we've had the dream of SOA, or service-oriented architectures, the idea being to be able to build more modular software that is able to be better componentized and managed. Containers are the right technology at the right time and help us to realize that dream. They allow us to take heavyweight monolithic architectures and technology stacks and refactor them into smaller, more manageable building blocks that are loosely coupled in a microservice-based architecture. This allows you to rapidly change or add features and functionality with minimal risk to the entire system and create a high velocity way of moving software through the software factory. I've already touched on the other technology trend that I believe will have a major positive impact in our ability to create new software, and that's machine learning and machine intelligence. Today, every time you swipe your credit card for a transaction, you are using machine learning and machine intelligence because your transaction isn't some anonymous thing that happens in a back-end system. Your transaction is done in the context of who you are, your behavior, your patterns, your ident identity uh, as an individual using machine learning and analytics on the, on the back-end to truly understand the context of that transaction. So you're already using machine learning and, and machine intelligence every day. And I believe that a, a, an example like preventing credit card fraud and transactions is just one small example of how broadly machine intelligence will be used to drive greater security across all of software. In fact, I believe that to significantly move the needle on security and all of our security challenges will require machine intelligence and machine learning to, apply, to be applied. Another area where I believe that machine learning and intelligence will be of tremendous benefit 
is around automation. Not simply having automation, which we try to do today, but applying intelligence to it across the entire process of building and delivering software. And to free up time to be able to put resources onto the more creative parts of the process. In order to prevent the creep of legacy from holding us back, we have to continuously refresh what we do. And it's important to not just build new things, but to also uh, factor out uh, things that have stopped uh, adding value or creating value. And that has to happen both above the line with ideas and below the line with our technology architectures in a process of constant, ongoing creative destruction that opens up green fields in both the idea factory and the modern software factory. You have to create bandwidth in order to drive new value and prevent legacy from holding you back. And this is a continuous cycle. The fact is that the software factory reaches customers and can drive insights and analytics to truly understand how customers are using the software. And that gets fed into the idea factory so that we inform the ideas that are being generated and to create a virtuous cycle between ideas and the delivery of value to customers. In all of this, we have to step back and remind ourselves what the entire point of the exercise is. What is the real value of technology? And the real value is in us. It's in people. It's a tool to make, help make us better, to unleash our full creative potential, and to add value and richness to our lives. And although we have to deal with the nitty-gritty of technology every day, we have to remember that. So as we look ahead at this fork in the road, we have to make sure that we take the time to step back, to understand the context of what we're trying to achieve, that we remind ourselves that the journey is important in the sense that uh, you, have to, you have to have meaning. There has to be real thought put behind uh, where you want to go and how you want to achieve it. And you also have to rethink the very structure uh, and, and process uh, by which you transform technology into real value in our everyday lives. I believe in doing so, we are going to have a very, very bright future. Events like Interop are a precious opportunity for us to take a step back, kind of put the day-to-day -day aside, and explore new thoughts, get different perspectives, and really help refresh and inform our view, not just individually, but collectively, of how we want to use technology. Uh, to achieve our vision, our dreams, and our aspirations. So with that, I want to thank you, and I hope you have a great rest of the show. Thank you.